Welcome to episode 313 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at sellingyourscreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing York Alec Shackleton, who was on the SYS podcast a while back in episode number 236. I will link to that in the show notes. Check it out if you haven't already listened to it. In that episode, we talk about his sort of his origin story, how he got into the business and worked his way up. York is back with another film called Disturbing the Peace, starring Guy Pierce. In this episode today, we'll be talking about that film, how it all came together, how he got involved with it, um, a lot of ins and outs on that. So stay tuned for that interview. Quick announcement, each year I put together an annual list of the best low-budget screenplays that have come through the SYS system. I got a little behind with the um, with the shooting of the movie in December, but I did get this out the first week of January, so it's now online. A big congratulations to all the writers who were chosen. Congratulations to Ronald Tom Thompson, um, Erica Myers, no relation to myself, but she does have the same last name, Dan Topol, I think he is an Australian writer, um, Andrew Erickson, Jeff Scott Phillips, Kate Niemuller. Um, again, congratulations to all of those writers um, for, for writing great scripts and, and getting recognized again within the SYS system. And now, hopefully, um, by being on the budget list, we can bring a little more attention to your projects. Um, anybody can, can check out the budget list, and so I will link to it in the show notes. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcasts. And then just look for episode number 313. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplays in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional logline and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I'm interviewing director York Alec Shackleton. Here is the interview. Welcome, York, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Well, thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate you having me here. So you were on um, the podcast before. It's episode number 236. I will refer people to that episode to learn more about your early career and how you got to the point where you're now directing feature films. And I will link to that in the show notes. Um, again, for all the listeners, that's episode number 236. So today we're going to talk about your most recent project, Disturbing the Peace, starring Guy Pierce. Maybe to start out, you can be give us a quick pitch or log line. What is this film all about? Yeah, he's basically a small-town marshal who's the only cop in town, and he has chosen not to carry a firearm uh, because of some stuff that's happened to him in his past. And a group of bikers come in and decide that they're going to take over this town and rob the bank and ultimately go for the armored vehicle that's coming out. And uh, he's got to stop them. So he decides by the end that it's time to carry a gun again, and single-handedly he takes out this group of bikers who are there to take down the bank and ultimately the whole town. I got you. So how did you get involved with this project? So this is a project that kind of came to me once it was already set up. Guy Pierce was attached to the project. It was, the screenplay was written, and they needed a first unit director for it. So they'd come to me with it. And I don't know if you remember last time we spoke, we talked a lot about earlier films in the 80s and the fundamentals of storytelling and how a lot of those earlier films were just very rich and full. So... This is the kind of stuff we've been looking for. You know, we would just love movies like Roadhouse, stuff from the 80s like that. And uh, this had a lot of that feel to it. And the producers wanted something that kind of had a contemporary Western feel to it. So we just felt like it was a perfect merger of those two ideas. Everyone was really on the same page about it. So that was kind of the, the whole way it came together and what we were looking to accomplish with it. Yeah. So tell me just about sort of the logistics of how this comes together. So was this through your agent? You have an agent that represents you as a director. And so the script kind of got passed down. They were initially considering you for second unit director. Is that what I'm understanding? And then you pitched them your take. So they said, oh, let's get York to direct to be um, the main director. Maybe just walk through that process, because I know there's always screenwriters that are just interested about how how they can get their scripts attached, um, how they can get a director attached to their scripts. 
Yeah, so, you know, at this point, it, it does come through an agent or manager. Um, you know, these come with offers attached to them. So these are projects that are, are already funded and have start dates and are ready to go. So it's a little bit different than going out and having to shop your your own screenplay around, you know, and raise funding. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you kind of get to that stage, it's it's really a matter of just looking at the material and deciding is this something that you can get behind and believe in. And with a project like this where you've got someone like Guy Pierce attached to it, it just brings a lot of value to that project because he's somebody who, you know, everybody wants to work with. And it, you learn an enormous amount when you get those opportunities to work with actors like that. And so when you're getting an offer and you're not selling the screenplay, there's just different decisions and different things that you're looking at for your career. And I would say to the screenwriters that are trying to sell their scripts, it's not about being a first unit director or a second unit director. What I, what I meant by saying first unit is they wanted somebody who knows how to work with actors, somebody who knows how to shot list movies, not somebody who just um, is going to come out and, and get the pretty shots and, and put it in the can. And so, you know, I can tell you that you want to work on your craft and you want to start doing some work and start making some short films. That's what did it for me was short films, documentaries, then all of a sudden making my own features. And when you've got some work under your belt, a lot of these production companies and studios, they're nervous about giving projects to first time directors because there's a lot of money on the line and there's a lot of actors Mm -hmm. careers on the line with stuff like this, especially if you have a guy Pierce. And so they want somebody who they can feel comfortable says, look, this person's got experience. They know what is coming down the road in front of them, and they know how to handle these sets and make these days. And that's really the best mm-hmm. advice I can give is to master your craft and know how to run that set and make every single day count because you're not on a project that has just endless funding. So you have to really be limber and make sure that you're maximizing every single day on set and getting all the best shots you can get. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And just, I wonder if just briefly you would have some sort of just general advice for a screenwriter who is looking for a director for their project, and it's in the early, early stages. Um, what do you recommend to some to somebody like that? Well, for me, I wrote a lot of what I was doing in the beginning myself, so I didn't deal too much with having to find directors, because I obviously want to be a director, and that's what I was working towards. Being a screenwriter who's not a director is kind of a vulnerable seat because as a writer you've got this vision and you're conveying this vision on the page but now once it's on the page it needs to now take on a whole other life where it's going to get conveyed onto the screen which is two stages really filming and then editing and both of those have such a big factor in what ultimately ends up coming out in the end so i think for a screenwriter the most important thing is to make sure that whoever you're going to get as a director has the same or at least close to the vision that you ultimately have for that project. And that goes for the studio or the production company that you're going to use to finance it and make it as well. Because so much can change throughout that process. And if you are very attached to your material and you see your material being done a certain way, that's, I think, why you hear a lot of those stories about writers passing on deals. And it's like, hey, you've never even had anything done before, but you're passing on this deal. And it's like, well, because that's not the way I see this film being done. Years go by, and then all of a sudden the film does get done the right way, and what do you know? That's Martin Scorsese. Boom, he just popped. You know what I'm saying? That's how careers like that begin, because the writer says no and holds on to the vision. So I would say that make sure that whoever you're going to get in business with sees the the same way that you do, or at least close to it. And you can figure that out by looking at their previous work. I mean, if somebody... They've just done the same type of film over and over and over again, and you're expecting them to give you something different for yours, more than likely it's going to be fairly similar to what you've seen them do in the past. So yeah, you yeah, do research sure. on people and getting acquainted with what their work style is, I think is the best way to decide who would be the best person to go with. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So just take us back again. Um, you mentioned Roadhouse was sort of um, a film that you guys liked and, and um, sort of maybe the tone of this one. Um, was that something that the producers came to you with or was that something that you read the script and then you come back to them and say, hey, I see this is kind of a Roadhouse picture? And what I'm really asking is like, you know, what did that process look like in terms of them interviewing you, them deciding you? I mean, maybe they sent this script out to other directors and other directors came mm-hmm. back with slightly different takes on it. Um, do you know why ultimately you got this job, other directors didn't? Um, and again, what did they actually mm. come to you with? Was it just the script, and did they have some sort of ideas um, already laid out there? Yeah, so anytime you come onto a project like this, the, the team that's already there has 
ideas, you know, and the direction that they're going in. But as a director, mm -hmm. it's really the, your auditioning process, you know, very similar to an actor. So you're going to go in there, you're going to read the screenplay, and you're going to go in, and you're going to give them your read on it. You know, the way I see the film being done, just my initial gut instincts, you know, I see it, this, this mm -hmm. budget um, done this way, utilizing these types of actors, these types of performances, you know, this kind of balance between the action and the drama, um, talking about reference films that I would feel like it would be like. So, you know, I'm going to bring up Roadhouse and stuff like that. They have the screenplay and they've got a rough idea of wanting it to be a contemporary Western, you know, something along those lines. So you start chiseling mm -hmm. that down. So I come in with very specific ideas of how to accomplish what they want, but also even make it more well-rounded. So I'm going to bring in ideas like, let's look at movies like Roadhouse and stuff like that, to see how they got good production value and really great action sequences and fight sequences because the script mm -hmm. was written in that way. It had those sequences written into it. So hmm. it's really an audition process and you go in and you give them all of those ideas and then it's up to them if they feel like you are the closest to what they want to see with the movie. It's very similar to casting an actor. You know, you're going to try to find someone who is already in real life as close to this character as possible so that they can go the rest of the distance every single day consistently without being very difficult for them. Mm -hmm. Did you ever um, go back and talk, talk with Chuck, who is the screenwriter of this, and sort of talk about your ideas as far as Roadhouse and that kind of stuff? Was when you were pitching the project, um, the first thing I thought of was sort of a, a contemporary high noon. Um, and I just mm -hmm. wonder if that's because that's your take on the material or if that was Chuck's original take on the material and you guys just were you know, in sync on that. Yeah, so that was definitely Chuck's original take on the material. That's what was sort of pitched to me in the beginning when the project came to me. So that was the bit of information that I knew going into the project. Okay, this is what they want to accomplish. Okay. And for a filmmaker, it's important, I think, to always kind of know what your end goal is. Because if you know what everyone involved wants to accomplish, then that can kind of help give you what the end goal vision is. And then it's very easy to kind of backtrack and create stepping stones to get to that place. So it can, it can become a very analytical process. Yeah, yeah. So what are some of the things about this screenplay um, that you particularly liked um, when you read it? Um, maybe you can just list off some things. And again, even just some things in general, but um, if there's some specific things about this screenplay that you really liked, I'd be curious to hear those. Well, I just thought it was a fun all-around screenplay. It, you don't see a lot of that stuff these days come around. Everyone, I think, is really trying to push the envelope visually. And this script was something that I saw that had story and it had a lot of depth to the story and the, the underlying character arcs that I just enjoyed digging those out as a filmmaker because that's what I was taught to do. And so without that, I feel like I'm not doing my full job, you know, if I'm not really digging into the performances and all of that. And so I just saw that that was there and it looked like a fun film. And I also love challenges as a filmmaker. And I think that when you try to bite off something with this level of actors, and that level of action, and that many guns, and you try to do it in a short period of time in a small town, Kentucky, with not a lot of resources nearby, that's a, a challenging process. And outside of just the filmmaking process itself, I love challenges and doing things and pointing things off that most people would say they wouldn't be able to do. So mm -hmm. it's more of just like a personal yeah. goal. Sure, sure. So um, were there some things about the script that you thought needed to be changed? And I'd be curious to see um, how you approach those, because it sounds like this project was pretty well developed by the time you got involved. Um, but were there any things that you needed that you thought needed to be changed? And, and how did you approach that? No, it just it's one of those things when you start converting over from pre-production to production, and it just becomes a, a logistic thing. Um, you have to be able to make changes because if the script's calling for a certain number of something and you don't have that there where you're at, then that change is being forced upon you. And so it's really important for you to be able to make quick, educated compromises on the fly in order to not compromise the integrity of the whole overall all film. So there really wasn't any changes that I wanted to personally make per se, other than just trying to expand dialogue here and there and give the actors more meat to chew on and working on the dialogue with the actors, those types of changes. I used to get really just changing the tone of production where they're saying, look, this group's coming for, excuse me, this type of motorcycle, but we can't get that type of motorcycle, but we can get this type over here. 
And then you're saying, okay, well, if that's all I got, I got to make that work. And now you're becoming creative on the fly right now to figure out how to not lose what the underlying root of the scene or whatever you're dealing with is. Yeah, for sure. How many days did you guys shoot? So we shot 18 days and we were done principal photography about 17 days. And then a second unit went on to just do a little bit of cleanup for us. I got you. And what does a crew on a film like this look like? Um, you know, how many G&E guys, um, a DP, how many ACs? I'm just curious sort of the scope of something like this. It's a, I mean, it's a, it's a down and dirty crew for sure when we do it like this. Uh, we're on location, and I would prefer to have really just a small handful of really good people opposed to a very large crew and not everyone's fully experienced on it, in, only in a situation like this. On larger films, it's much different. You need to have a lot of people thrown at every single problem. But with this one, you know, we have a good, we have a good DP. We've got a good gaffer, and then each of them is going to have like four underneath them for their ACs and their assistants and that stuff. Um, we're going to have a really good production coordinator, and we're going to have a good AD, and we're going to have a really good art department, and which is going to be one guy, maybe two at the most, because you're going to split the props and the art, and we're going to have a couple girl crew for hair and makeup and a small little wardrobe group and that's pretty much it with this movie you also have a stunt crew but you know these are all we're talking two four man crews basically in each department and a lot of them wear multiple hats but you get you get down and dirty like that and everyone's enjoying it and they're in control of these departments and you tend to see um, a better quality of work yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, were you privy to any of um, of any of the process of getting Guy Pierce um, attached? I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on that. Just in terms of, um, you know, I get a lot of emails from people. How can I get this actor attached or that actor attached? Um, do you do you know anything about how you guys got Gar- Guy Pierce involved with the project? Well, just like with directors and and, any, and writers, you know, at that point in your career, you're represented by agencies and management. And so their fielding offers is, is pretty much how it, it goes down unless you've got some sort of personal relationship that, uh, one, a, a type of relationship where you actually can go to somebody and say, hey, I've got something that I take you seriously and they're interested in what you're doing. But really outside mm-hmm. of that, it's done the traditional way, which is with offers. Now, those offers are going to get taken seriously if they're backed by a pay, pay or play offer. So that means mm-hmm. the studio's, the people who have made a lot of movies are obviously going to get taken more seriously when they make an offer because they can put the money behind it and say, if this actor says yes, here's their money, and the movie's ready to go. So that's what the agencies are looking for. They're looking for paychecks. You know, The actor wants mm-hmm. to roll. The agent wants them to build their career and make a lot of money. And so yeah. you can get stuck in a pile you know, that never gets looked at, but the minute you can separate yourself from other projects by either having a lot of buzz about it, a lot of people talking about it, and getting handed around town, or by having money behind it where you can actually back a pay-or-play offer, which means you're going to offer the actor that role at a certain price. And if he reads the script and says yes, he's guaranteed that money whether you make the movie or not. And so it mm-hmm. puts them in a situation where the agent can say, okay, while you're on your vacation this weekend, read this script. There's a solid offer behind it, and if you like it, this is a go movie for you to do. And it's the type of material that you told me you've been looking for right now. So that's where you need to fit yourself into that model somehow. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, what's next for you? What are you um, working on now? Um, I'm doing a really cool project next I'm excited about. We're doing, um, it's a little bit of a bigger budget. And it's dealing with animal cruelty and activism. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Sea Shepherd and Paul Watson. No. So he was a part of Greenpeace, and he went on to um, start Sea Shepherd, where they've got these big ships now, and they go out and they try to stop all the whalers, you know, the illegal Japanese whaling and all of these people that are just out in the ocean just doing these long line fishing. And he had written a book about his his whole adventure while doing this, and um, he's a very well-known guy for the whole thing that he did, to save the animals from animals, and still continues to do it this day. So we're going to do his story next. Um, It looks like we'll hopefully be shooting in the fall. Wow. Yeah, it sounds like an incredible story, although I don't envy being out on the water for all those days shooting. It sounds like a <laughs> Yeah. I never said my, my job was pretty or easy. But, you know, that's what we got to do to get it up on the screen so that you can go and enjoy it. 
Yeah, for sure. So how can people see Disturbing the Peace? Do you know what the um, release schedule is going to be like? Yeah, so we're doing Day and Date on January 17th. It's going to be in theaters all across the United States. Um, there's actually a lot more theaters than I was expecting. And they're going to release it at the same time on on demand and pay-per-view. So you'll be able to catch it across all platforms. And you'll be able to see it in a theater nearby if it's something you're interested in. Perfect, perfect. And what's the best way for people to keep up with what you're doing? Twitter, Facebook, a blog, anything you're comfortable sharing, I will round up for the show notes. Yeah, the usual stuff. I mean, I post a lot of videos and stuff that I make and work on on YouTube. I still use those platforms. But, um, you know, I've got Facebook, um, Twitter, and Instagram. I post a lot of photos on there and keep everyone kind of up to date with what's going on. And just try to keep it fun for everyone. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Well, I'll track down those links and I'll put them in the show notes. Um, York, once again, I really appreciate your coming on the show and talking with me. Good luck with this film and good luck on your next film as well. Hopefully I'll um, be here and can talk to you about that when it's done. Yeah, no, definitely. Thanks for having me. I look forward to talking again soon. Perfect. Sounds good. We'll talk to you later. A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high quality professional evaluation on your screenplay. When you buy our three pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website, and you can pick the reader who you think is the best fit for your script. Turnaround time is usually just a few days, but rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors, concept, character, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We can provide an analysis on features or television scripts. We also do proofreading without any analysis. We will also look at a treatment or outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your project ideas, this is a great way to do it. We will also write your logline and synopsis for you. You can add this logline and synopsis writing service to an analysis, or you can simply purchase this service as a standalone product. As a bonus, if your screenplay gets a recommend or a consider from one of our readers, you get to list the screenplay in the SYS Select database, which is a database for producers to find screenplays and a big part of our SYS Select program. Producers are in the database searching for material on a daily basis, so it's another great way to get your material in front of them. As a further bonus, if your script gets a recommend from one of our readers, your screenplay will get included in our monthly best of newsletter. Each month we send out a newsletter that highlights the best screenplays that have come through our script analysis service. This is monthly newsletter that goes out to our list of over 400 producers who are actively looking for material. So again, this is another great way to get your material out there. So if you want a professional evaluation of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. That's our show for today. Thank you for listening.